Well, we finished with the comparison instructions. Now we're going to start in a new section, the compute and or math instructions. First up is the add instruction and the subtract instruction. In the first phase of the labs for the add and subtract instructions, we're going to demonstrate a behavior of this type of instruction before we get any deeper. Basically what I had you do was flip on the switch wired up to memory location I0 slash 0 and then after a few seconds or so turn it off and then do the same with the switch wired up to memory location I0 slash 1. Now you might have thought that the add instruction would increment the register N70 by one each time you toggled the switch on and off and the subtract instruction would decrement N71 by one each time you toggled switch I colon 0 slash 1 on and off. However, what did the instructions do to the registers N70 and N71 as long as the switches were on? Before we fill in the answer, we basically expect the first time we use these instructions that every time you toggle that memory location I00 or I01 that the instruction is going to execute once. In other words, you're going to take N70 and add one and then store it in N70. Then the next time you toggle it, N70 is now one, you're going to add another one, that's going to be two, and we expect the same thing for the subtract instruction. However, these instructions actually execute every single program scan that they're true. So the add instruction and the subtract executes each true scan, which means every single scan, that's 1,000 times a second, is going to add one to N70 and store it in N70, which basically means that rung zero is a scan counter. It's going to increment on every single program scan. So uh, that's just an interesting behavior. Uh, if you only wanted to add source B to source A once, you have to use a one shot. Whatever you do, you can only let it execute once for each event, not just leave it on and let it continually increment. Now, I had you switch on memory location I colon zero slash zero and leave it on until N70 exceeded 32,767. Remember, that's the high limit for 16-bit signed integer. And what happened? An overflow causes the processor to put itself into the faulted state. You get what I always refer to as the red winky, because you get the fault light and it's winking at you, like it knows something you don't. In the lab, at this point we had you go to the air, read what the fault was about, read what type of air it was, and then clear the fault or clear the air. Then we ask you what will happen if you put the controller into the run mode without switching input zero off first. Keep in mind that the add instruction, the destination N70 is still 32,767, which is the upper positive limit for 16-bit signed integer. So the instant that you put it back in the run mode on the very first program scan, you're going to get another dose of the red winky because it's on the very first scan it's going to increment by one. That is an overflow and it goes back into the faulted mode. Okay, so we then had you clear N70 and add one-shot rising instructions into each of the rungs as shown here on the screen. We're not going to cover one-shot rising instructions at this point in the program. We will, they will be covered later on in another lab in more detail. It's sufficient to say right now that all of the permissives or instructions to the left of the one-shot rising when they are all true, then the one shot rising will be true for one scan. On the very next scan, it will be false, which means every time the permissives to the left of the one shot rising go from false to true, 
the AND instruction will execute once, or in the next rung, the SUBTRACT instruction. Keep in mind that all math instructions execute every true scan, and they do not have a false execution. So when the run goes false, the AND and SUBTRACT, any of the math instructions have no execution. A continuation of working with the add and subtract instructions. We had you um, type in this logic, save it, download and go online with it. And basically what we're doing here is demonstrating using add and subtract instructions to work with registers to keep track of product that's been moved on to conveyors or off of conveyors. And here we have conveyor 1 and conveyor 2. To represent the product count on conveyor 1, we use N70, 16-bit signed integer register. And for the product count on conveyor 2, we use N71. To recognize when product is moving on to conveyor 1, we use photo I1. To recognize product is left conveyor 1 and is going on to conveyor 2, we use photo I2. So photo I1 and photo I2 are going to execute the majority of this logic to determine how many product or what the count is of product on conveyor 1 and conveyor 2. We have N751, which is the production count. So we're assuming that any time a product passes by photo I1, that's part of the production count when it goes by photo I2, that's not part of the production count. So if you look at rung 0, you see that the first add instruction increments N751 each time product comes on to conveyor 1. We also do a conveyor count with N70. Then we also have the conveyor count for N uh, for conveyor 2 for, and we use N71. So you see in the second rung when something goes by photo I2 we subtract it from N70. In other words we subtract it from conveyor 1 and then the, the other add instruction adds it to conveyor 2. And then in rung 2 we add both N70 and N71 because Whatever the count is for product going on to conveyor 1, even though it's left conveyor 1, subtracted from conveyor 1 and added to conveyor 2, N70 and N71 together should always add up to whatever the count was for N751 for the production count. And if at any time those are not equals, we turn on an alarm, alarm bit. We call it the audit alarm, which means that the counts aren't adding up the way they should. So if we go ahead and execute this logic, we have product come on to conveyor 1, photo I1 increments the count to 1. Next carton on, increments it to 2. Next carton, increments it to 3. Then we turn on conveyor 1 and conveyor 2. We leave conveyor 1 on to conveyor 2 so that decrements or subtracts from conveyor 1 and adds it to conveyor 2. Subtract from conveyor 1, add it to conveyor 2. Subtract from, subtract from conveyor 1, add it to conveyor 2. There are many things you could do to enhance this logic if you were actually doing an application. You can use count up and count down. I prefer add and subtract for some other reasons that we won't go into here. Also, you may want a debounce timer. In other words, in rung 0 and rung 1, I just have the photo eyes triggering the math instructions. But you may actually want to use the photo eye as a permissive for an on delay timer and then use the timer done bit to actually increment or decrement counts on the conveyors because when a cardboard container or any object moves through a photo eye, if there's any waltz or dance or wiggle or jumping around on the conveyor, the leading edge and the trailing edge can actually alternately block and pass the photo eye beam many times for one actual object. If you can picture 
uh, the straight front edge of a carton uh, wiggling back and forth forward and back you could see that it could go in and out of the photo eye two or three times when there's really only one carton so this is not meant to be uh, an illustration of really good logic for working with photo eyes on conveyors we're only giving you an idea of how you might use add and subtract instructions in a real application The next step we had you actually create a miscount to demonstrate a situation where you had more or less cartons show up than what were supposed to be there. So we had to use input 0 and input 1 to simulate cartons of product passing 1 PE and 2 PE, photo I1, photo I2. Toggle 5 cartons onto conveyor 1 and then toggle 6 cartons onto conveyor 2. Well, how did 6 get on to two unless they came off of one. Now how this could actually happen in real life is let's say a carton uh, fell off of the process before conveyor one. So an employee comes along, he picks it up, looks at it, sees that the buffer zone in front of conveyor one is full, he looks at conveyor two, he sees an empty spot, he leans over and sets it on conveyor one. Uh, on the front of this you might say well what's wrong with that well what's wrong with it is that carton might be bad product that carton might not, not even be the right product so in order to audit that situation we had the audit alarm did the audit alarm energize when we toggled six, cart six cartons on a conveyor two yes and the reason why more cartons passed by two PE from conveyor one then were originally counted on to conveyor one. One thing that did happen in the previous lab was because you subtracted more cartons off of conveyor one than were actually loaded, you end up with a negative count. So we said, well, how would you modify your logic to prevent a negative count on conveyor one? In other words, you have an odd alarm. So you could also use a negative count to trigger an alarm too, but w that's not necessary. So you could do it your own way, edit your logic any way you like, or as shown here, clear out conveyor one and two of counts so you can start from scratch, then repeat the previous sequence of five cartons counting onto conveyor one and then counting six off of conveyor one onto conveyor two, or in other words, create a miscount. Did the audit alarm energize? Yes, it did. A miscount is a miscount, but there is no negative count for conveyor one now because we used the comparison instruction greater than, and we do not subtract a count from N70 unless N70 is more than one. That way we'll never, never get a negative count. 